afraid that you'll be uh, rushing. Oh no 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 no! If you once you sit down, it won't be a problem. Tight program this afternoon. I think it's time to get started. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Yifi Duan. Uh, please. Uh, so I'd like to start by apologizing for the uh, embarrassing incident this morning, and I want to thank the organizers for giving me the second chance to speak here, uh, to present my work with my collaborators at this wonderful conference. The title of my talk will be uh, Super Amplitudes and Power Normalization Conditions in Supergravities. And it will be based on the, uh, uh, a list of works I with my uh, supervisor at Howard uh, Xi and also uh, uh, students uh, in Xinjiang uh, and Xu Hong Xiao. Okay? And there's some, also uh, some work in progress. And so the plan of the talk will be uh, the following. So first I'll give you a brief overview of uh, the, the supersymmetric number of measuring conditions known in the literature. Okay? And then I'll introduce to you the uh, super amplitudes approach. And, and afterwards I'll tell, uh, I'll tell you about applications to, uh, of the super amplitude method to derive non-regulization conditions in uh, uh, type 2B and other maximal supergravities or uh, say four-point graviton uh, couplings. And after that, I'll, uh, I'll tell you about uh, similar constraints derived using the same method uh, for tensor multiple couplings in 60 to complex zero supergravity. And lastly, I'll uh, wrap up and give you a brief summary and some outlook for future directions. So as you all know, supersymmetry puts uh, non-trivial constraints on the dynamics of supersymmetric theories. And the natural question to ask is how do they manifest the level of uh, the quantum effective action? Okay? These are what's commonly known as non renormalization theorems or non renormalization conditions. So there are basically two camps to approach this problem. One of them is, the op is using the offshore superspace, uh, which has been su uh, extremely successful for uh, less supersymmetries, for example, for four superchargers and eight superchargers. Uh, this is commonly known as the homomorphicity conditions um, for superpotential terms that's been uh, pioneered by Cyber and then Dine Cyber. For example, you all know that for the West Middle, uh, superpotential is not renormalized non perturbatively. And there are similar conditions, uh, similar statements for prepotential in the two supersymmetric field theories. And the other camp is uh, based on the on-shell superspace formalism, which is uh, uh, more useful for uh, theories with, with more supersymmetries. And differential constraints uh, on higher derivative couplings uh, in these kind of theories have been worked out by uh, Sethi, Stern, uh, and Aban, and also Green and Sethi for theories uh, with 16 supercharges uh, in four dimensions and also uh, supergravity, the uh, type to be supergravity in 10 dimensions. The strategy that they employ is basically to consider explicit variation of the uh, effective action and the supercharge simultaneously um, to satisfy this kind of uh, consistency condition, meaning that um, this slicing the uh, vehicle homology associated with this deformed supercharge. And the one of the example that Michael Green has uh, told us about in the previous talk is that this R to the force coupling in type 2B supergravity its coefficient, which depends on the exodilaton, which perhaps has the scalar manifold, satisfies some kind of Laplace differential equation on the scalar manifold. Okay. And this, these are the type of uh, supersymmetric constraints that we'll be looking at in the rest of this talk. Uh, so let me uh, briefly tell you about the, some technical limitations of the traditional approach. Um, as I have already said, we'll be interested in this talk. We'll be interested in theories with 16 and 32 supercharges, 
uh, there's no uh, simple off-shell for the super space formism that's I mean for our purpose here. Um, then the method uh, the method of explicitly uh, constructing deformation of supercharge and of the effective action and to satisfy this consistent condition quickly goes out of hand when you consider uh, general couplings you such a higher degree to others. Um, so, uh, and uh, more generally, the, this Lagrangian approach to uh, deformation and supersymmetric constraints are subject to um, the fewer, defi fewer definition ambiguities. And uh, the, uh, as I have already said, uh, the deformation of the supercharge is generally nonlinear, and that's a technical problem that you have to you have to deal with in this traditional approach. And as I'll explain the next uh, slide. Uh, this kind of uh, problem will be trivialized in the superamplitude approach. So let me briefly remind you what are superamplitudes, uh, which will be relevant in uh, the following uh, discussion. So superamplitude is an elegant way to package the amplitudes related by supersymmetries using the convenient uh, kinematic variables, which are the so-called super spinner holistic variables. Uh, in the case of type B's regarding 10 dimensions, um, these spinner holistic variables have been first worked out by uh, Karen Hort, uh, O'Connell, both O'Connell, which are in the audience. Um, and they involve a pair of uh, 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 variables. Uh, one is the bosonic uh, spinner holistic, the usual spinner holistic variables, lambda alpha A, where alpha is the, uh, the power spinner index of SO10, and A is the SO8 little group index. And eta a uh, parameterizes the eight Grassmann variables. So the, these Grassmann variables, the monomials in the Grassmann variables, will give you the one particle states in the supergravity multiple in type B supergravity. So there are 256 of them, as, as you know. And this, uh, this bosonic spinner holistic variables lambda satisfy the condition they square to the momentum associated with the one particle. And from, this, uh, from these variables, you can construct the supercharges uh, associated with the particles, which are bilinear in lambda and eta, and similar for the Q tilde, the conjugate, and they satisfy the expected uh, unshell super, uh, supersymmetry algebra. Using this convenient set of uh, uh, spinner density variables, it's very easy to write down uh, super amplitudes, which are solutions to supersymmetric word entities. Uh, in this type to be super gravity, and they all take this form. Okay? So there's a simple uh, generalization of usual momentum conservation in this super symmetric case, which you have this delta 16 Q, uh, so you can think of as a product of all uh, 16 components of the uh, supercharge Q. And uh, I should uh, emphasize that this Q here is the sum of the individual supercharges, so it's just direct generalization of the total momentum conservation here. And this curly f is a function, in general, is a function of lambda i and eta i. But because we want this whole thing to be supersymmetric, uh, this f is subject to the supersymmetric word entity. Um, I should say that uh, uh, half of the supersymmetric word entities are trivialized in this, uh, when, when, when I write in this form because of the delta 16q. But the other 16 supercharges uh, has to be enforced by this condition. Okay? But it's very easy to solve this kind of, to come up with a solution to this condition as we'll see. And that's about super amplitudes, which are very general objects in this uh, construction. Um, but a special subclass of super amplitudes are such that uh, are those that do not have poles uh, uh, in momentum and in any combination of the momentum. And these are, uh, these are what we will refer to as super vertices. Okay? Uh, as we'll see, the super vertices uh, will represent the freedom in deforming uh, supersymmetric uh, theory in the perspective of amplitudes. And conversely, the absence of super vertices at some particular derivative order uh, with particular uh, quantum numbers will signal constraints on the corresponding coupling in the effective action. Um, compared to the Lagrangian description, um, uh, the super vertices, the, 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 uh, using super vertices to parameterize supersymmetric deformation has the advantage that it's much easier to construct and classify. And uh, um, it also, uh, it, uh, and, and that is because uh, the supercharges um, uh, in this uh, context acts always linearly on assembly states, no matter what kind of higher degree term to add to effective action. Okay? Unlike in the uh, Lagrangian case, 
this uh, supercharger typically act non-linearly on the fields when you introduce higher due to, higher due to correction to the effective action. Um, similar examples of the super vertices are, uh, for example, for the R to the force coupling, take the following form. Uh, so I've, I've, from now on, I'll suppress the momentum conservation at a 10, uh, just for notational simplicity. So for the uh, full point R to the force vertex, which is that A due into the other, it's simply represented by the delta 16 Q. Okay? We have 16 Qs, so that A due to order and D4 to the R to the force vertex, which is that um, half due to the order that simply writes that the delta 16 Q times this combination of Mendelstein variables, so it satisfy uh, the most symmetry. And the list goes on. So, uh, so what, what is like the general strategy here to construct uh, supersymmetric deformation satisfying some constraints in terms of superamplitudes? So as I explained to you, the main strategy is to, uh, to study supersymmetric deformation uh, uh, in the language of uh, amplitude rather than in the Lagrangian approach, uh, and, uh, but it's uh, subject to some uh, necessary, uh, but subject to some consistent conditions. One of the conditions is just the supersymmetric ordinances, obviously, but that is uh, trivial, trivially satisfied for these super amplitudes because it's very easy to uh, find solutions. And also, there's no fewer definition ideas. And as I explained, the supercharges are stays on deform when you add higher, higher degree corrections. Um, but the second, there's a second constraint which is uh, non, uh, more non trivial, and it is, uh, as you know, the factorization, or in other words, unitarity constraint. Uh, this kind of constraint is kind of obvious in the Lagrangian approach to deformation of effective action, and uh, factorization is basically built in. But in this uh, super amplitude approach, um, this factor addition would relate super amplitudes with different number of external legs, and this will turn out to uh, lead to uh, will turn out to be leading to uh, differential equations on the scalar manifold okay, of this uh, super symmetric theories. And after you have uh, fulfilled this kind of conditions, you can translate the constraints on the super amplitudes back into the language of the effective action and to derive uh, the, this kind of differential equation on the couplings. Okay. So let's, uh, to il illustrate that this procedure, let's look at one simple, exact, uh, simple example step by step. And this will be the R to the force coupling in type 2B supergraphed in 10 dimensions. Um, I will emphasize here that uh, uh, in some step of this uh, discussion, I'll, uh, I'll evolve string theory, but the answer we get for this kind of coupling will not depend on string theory. It's just a pure consequence of supersymmetry. And so suppose we have such a coupling in the effective action of a 10-dimensional ten supergravity uh, uh, of the type to be type. Um, then we can expand out, uh, because this theory has a scalar manifold parameterized by, uh, well, parameterized by two real scalars, which were packaged into tau. We can expand out this kind of coupling around some background value for tau. Uh, once you expand it out, this, this, uh, coupling, this naive four-point coupling actually captures a whole tower of high-point couplings um, of the following form. Okay? So you can think of this kind of uh, coupling as capturing the soft limit of any higher point uh, amplitudes. And this kind of uh, this kind of effective coupling obviously contribute to the amplitudes corresponding to the, raise the corresponding uh, level of derivative expansion and also to the corresponding number of external legs. And uh, because of the supersymmetric theory, by assumption, uh, they must be super com supersymmetric competent uh, e either at a Lagrangian level or at the super uh, at the amplitude level. Okay? <coughs> At the amplitude level, uh, it can be either super completed by super symmetric completed by some super vertex, uh, which has no poles, and, and for such reason, it is unconstrained, and you can freely adjust those coefficients. And this is the case for the R to the force uh, coupling, and this delta tau R to the force coupling, and delta tau bar to the force coupling. So you just think of this delta, par, delta tau and delta tau bar as the actual delta tau, uh, soft actual delta tau. Okay? And this kind of uh, uh, four, five, six, uh, four, five, five point couplings at eight degree to order can be super super symmetric completed by this kind of uh, super vertices. Okay? These are these these are uh, expressions in terms of this uh, pure, uh, 
supersplint and it's the uh, variables which satisfy the supersymmetric wire latencies. And they are not subject to factorization because they have no poles. On the other case, um, uh, certain couplings in this uh, expansion uh, can only be supersymmetric completed by uh, super amplitudes, uh, which will have poles. And it, in, in this case, the super amplitudes will necessarily be determined by factorizations into lower point um, super vertices. And one example is uh, this kind of coupling right here. Right? So this is a uh, this coupling is special in the sense that uh, it carries no U uh, one R charge in the type to be super gravity, whereas this kind of couplings carry U uh, one R charge. Okay. So because of uh, uh, this kind of uh, six point coupling here uh, can only be uh, super symmetric completed by uh, super amplitudes, and it has the super amplitude itself must be uh, determined by factorization to lower point. Uh, super vertices, we can derive some kind of linear relation between the between these uh, couplings that sit in front of the higher point vertex and the lower point vertex. Uh, the factorization channels relevant here are either of this type or this type. Uh, the gray blob here represents the lower point four point vertex at a derivative to the other, and this solid uh, three point vertices are the two derivative uh, super gravity vertices that we all know and love. Okay? And this external legs, the solid legs here, uh, they represent the super gravity multiplet. And so for example, uh, you can choose this four to be uh, uh, associated with the graviton, this two to be associated with either the, the exodilata and this conjugate combination. Okay. And this, uh, this is very similar. So, um, so this is how you, you recover this kind of uh, relation. So once again, it's delta tau, delta tau bar f, evaluate the background value. Is the coefficient of the uh, uh, of the six point uh, <coughs> coupling that that lies in the soft limit of six point amplitude, and this f tau zero tau bar zero is the coefficient that sits in front of the four point uh, r to the four super vertex. Okay. And the reason that only this factorization channel show up, which is a simple consequence of derivative counting, because here we are looking at some adu coupling, and uh, each of this uh, Solid vertices are of two derivative level, and each propagator gives you minus two derivative counting. And this solid blob, because it's R to the four, to give you eight derivative counting. So eight plus two plus two minus two minus two will give you the same number of derivatives. Okay. So from this, uh, uh, from the, from this factorization, we 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 kind of we already arrive at a differential equation, but with some unknown coefficient a. And the next, the next step is just to fix this coefficient a using some knowledge about, uh, well, you can either in principle fix this a by knowledge about its explicit the form of the uh, six point super amplitude, or you can use some trick, meaning that if you already know a particular solution to the uh, super symmetric word entity in the effective action, you can just plug it in and to find a. Okay? And the trick we will invoke here come from string theory. So the string theory, uh, string tree level amplitudes uh, satisfy uh, the supersymmetric word entity, the satisfy supersymmetric word entity by construction. Okay. So from, uh, as Michael Green has shown in his talk, uh, this is the famous uh, string tree level amplitudes uh, for type to B, and you can just expand out in terms of alpha prime or derivative expansion, and you read off uh, the eighth derivative term, uh, which is after you transform into the Einstein frame, which is simply give you f equal to tau 2 to the 3 halves. And tau 2 is just the imagined part of tau. And as, as I've said, the string theory construction generates this solution to the supersymmetric word entity in the effective action. So you can just plug this in to fix this coefficient a. So we can do that, and it turns out that a is just 3 um, quarters. Okay? And I want to emphasize here again that the three quarters, although we have evolved the string theory to, evaluate, to find this number, it is just a pure consequence of supersymmetry and unitarity. The, the equation, the differential equation we, we arrive at, uh, does not rely on string theory. And of course, you can play the same game for the other kind of uh, uh, the other uh, higher coupling, such as d4 r to the four and d6 r to the four. 
before Arctl4 is very similar to Arctl4, and you just arrive at a similar differential equation. And for D6 Arctl4, there's one novelty, and that is there's a new factorization channel that shows up. Because the derivative level here is 6 plus 8, that's 14. Okay? This allows you to factorize uh, the 6 point amplitudes involving tau tau bar and, and 4 gravitons into two Arctl4 super vertices. Okay? There's 8 plus 8 minus 2, that's uh, six, 14. Uh, and uh, so that's why you have this extra term, uh, f squared, and this, uh, this coefficient can again be fixed by some uh, input function theory. Okay, uh, there is some further application in type 2b. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, you, can, uh, you can consider uh, these dimensional reduced cousins, and there are similar uh, differential constraints you can derive. And you can also apply this to the free brain effect dimension. Because the shorter time, I'll uh, go on to the next uh, dimension. <coughs> so let's now switch gear and talk about uh, half maximum supergravity in six dimensions. These are 62, 0 supergravities um, from compatification of type B supergravity on a K3 manifold. Uh, this supergravity, uh, the metacon of supergravity consists of one supergravity multiplet and 21 self dual tensor multiplet. These numbers are representing the SU2 cross SU2 little group um, uh, representations. And it's not very important for this purpose here. And this theory has SO5 uh, uh, R symmetry and has a very large uh, scalar manifold uh, or vacuum moduli, which is parameterized by this coset SO21,5, uh, SO5 times SO21. That's a 105 dimensional um, homogeneous manifold. Okay. And well, practically, the uh, parameterize this uh, scalar manifold by phi a. The a runs from 1 to uh, 105. And what will be interesting in this kind of uh, couplings with the tensor multiplets, this h, uh, this h denotes, uh, sorry, this, this is the confusing, this a is different from that, and sorry, this, this a here goes from 1 to 21. Uh, this h um, represents the field strength for the uh, tensor multiplets, for the, uh, sorry, for the self dual tensor and the tensor and these have two tensor in the tensor multiplets. So we can play the same game and look at uh, uh, if there's a if certain super vertices are absent, uh, we can look at the factorization channel and from the factorization channel we can derive some relation between higher point, um, higher point um, coupling and lower point um, couplings. Okay? And this is the case, for example, for the F4 ABCD kind of coupling. And this is the schematically how it looks like without fixing these coefficients. This is the factorization channel. So this is supposed to be the H to the fourth coupling. And this is the factorization into uh, lower point tensor multiple and the graviton multiple couplings. So the, this uh, S line here represents some intermediate graviton. Uh, there's a similar uh, story for the D2H to the force coupling. Okay. And the phi again, here, this phi uh, parameterizes the 105 uh, scalars leading out the scalar manifold. Uh, but the equation looks more complicated because, sorry, the candidate uh, differential equation looks more complicated and involves quadratic pieces in F4 because it allows the factorization to uh, two uh, H to the force super vertices. Okay. And when, as before, once we've written down this ansatz for the differential equation, we can then uh, proceed to fix these coefficients uh, using some actual inputs. And this actual inputs here again comes from uh, string theory. Uh, but the computation of uh, the string amplitudes on K3, uh, for type 2b on K3, is very complicated. Um, and then it is very uh, useful to involve this uh, duality between type 2b on K3 times S1 and have heterotic string on T5. Under this duality, the H to the fourth coupling and D to H fourth coupling are mapped to F to the fourth and D to F to the fourth coupling in the heterotic string, where the F becomes the field strength for the vector multiplets in the heterotic string. And we want to look at a limit where the S1 decompatifies, and in this limit, the heterotic string uh, coupling and heterotic string scale uh, both go to infinity. And in this limit, we'll see the heterotic string amplitude simplifies dramatically. And it simplifies so dramatically that the whole tower of analog string amplitudes uh, uh, collapse into one loop and two loop contributions. So the statement that f to the fourth and f to the sixth coupling for type to be on K3 are entirely captured by genus one, genus two amplitudes in analog string on D5. 
And this is a genus one amplitude, and this is genus two amplitude. So the F1 is a fundamental domain, uh, um, it's the usual fundamental domain, okay, that parameterized the, uh, the moduli of uh, torus. And this F2 is, is parameterizing the, uh, this, this is a single half plane that parameterized the moduli of the genus two rim surface. This omega ij uh, are the pure images. And theta function, this theta function is the usual theta function for, the, for this lattice, um, cell to lattice of rank 21,5. Uh, and the scalar dependence phi is hidden in the theta function. It's more precisely it's hidden in the uh, it's hidden in the embedding of this lattice lambda in R21 comma five. Okay. So we can uh, we can this is like a very horrible um, expression, horrible uh, integral. But we can actually plug it into the differential equation, and uh, here are the coefficients directed. We check that uh, this kind of integral expression uh, satisfies the following differential equation with this kind of uh, with, uh, differential equation with this coefficients. So, since I'm running out of time, let, just me, uh, let me just wrap up. So, I hope I've convinced you that superamplitude is a very uh, simple and efficient method to exhaust all constraints for supersymmetry uh, in the quantum effective action of supersymmetric theories. And there are many uh, future directions. For example, we can consider uh, lifting many of the superpartisan construction to 11 uh, to dimensional uh, supergravity jam theory and to derive some constraint, supersymmetric constraint on hybrid terms there, uh, following the work of Russell Sackley and Green Mahouf, and also my work with him. And it's also useful to compare the differential equation we obtain here with the ones that occurred in the indufortable equal strain uh, on the work of Berkowitz and Valtha. And we can also move to theories with lower supersymmetries, such as with theories with these supercharges. And there are also many uh, kind of uh, differential equations uh, for um, higher degree couplings in such theories, in what's known as the BCOB anomaly equations. It would be interesting to understand how to construct, uh, how to derive that, those equations from supersymmetry. And it will also be uh, important to understand uh, how this kind of different equations arrive from the worksheet uh, conformal polarization theory in the context of string theory. And lastly, um, there are also many uh, constraints that can be derived from magnitudes uh, on the effective action of theories with, with or without supersymmetry. And for uh, such aspects, um, I think Wen and uh, Chang will talk about. Uh, they're also very interesting. All right, with that, I'll leave it. Uh, and thank you. Sorry, I had to push a little bit. Uh, I know how difficult it is to give a 25 minute talk, but we managed. Are there any questions? Why does this twister superspace more useful than ordinary 10 dimensional kinetic superspace? Sorry, say that again? We started by discussing 10 dimensional twisters. No, no, it's the spinner holistic. Whatever. Why can't you just use ordinary chiral superspace? With 16 chi thetas, why is it better than that? Why is it? Uh, 16 chi. Two intervals over 16 of the 32 thetas, it's the usual chi of That's like this delta 16 of Q. So here we have uh, only uh, eight Grassmann variables. How did that, how is that useful for you? That's what I'm asking. Where did you use that? The reason we have eight. No, oh, I understand that it's eight, but why is that useful in your computation? Where no, just useful for writing down this uh, super vertices. I mean, maybe, maybe we can discuss later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Would it help you to constrain the lower into parameters if you have knowledge of how to solve tilt on uh, yeah. behaviors? Yeah, I think it will, it will give us uh, like a stronger handle on this uh, on this low energy effective action. Right? That's something we have not explored. That that will be some additional input. Okay, I see no further questions. So thanks again.